Good evening, everyone. Good to have you here. Um, I'm just getting settled. <laughs> a little discombobulated. It's a little too warm to have a fire in the fire uh, place inside. So we're out in the patio, out in the garden, enjoying the outdoors. And there is a fire going. I can show you. I can prove it. Just one second. There it is. It's going. There's the fire. <laughs> so as the fire roars, so does the lion. <laughs> anyway, good to have you all here. Good to see you, Samantha, Mark. Tonight we're going to um, do more of uh, The Horse and His Boy, which is a really great story. And then uh, tomorrow night, we will start, we're going to read some excerpts from Beyond the Wardrobe, the official guide to Narnia, about that. There'll be some random readings this week in C.S. Lewis, and then we'll start a series next Tuesday. On uh, Monday, Thursday, I'm going to be broadcasting, I hope, from inside uh, Trinity Episcopal Church. And uh, we usually have a Monday, Thursday, 12-hour prayer vigil starting at um, 7 in the evening till 7, uh, seven or eight in the evening until seven in the morning, eight in the morning. And we're not able to do that, so uh, I'm gonna be broadcasting um, both uh, Thursday, Monday, Thursday at um, three for tea, probably outside the church or maybe even inside, showing some of the architectural details. And then we'll have a meditation and I'll have a uh, an actual installation, the art installation, which um, I've had for Bondi Thursday for several years now for the prayer vigil, and a painting of something that happened during one of the uh, prayer vigils. So I will um, be doing that, and then we'll get back to our regular schedule next week. Easter Monday, not to confuse you, <laughs> uh, I will not be broadcasting, and then we'll start on Tuesday. But uh, the rest of the week, tomorrow at tea time, I'm interviewing. I'm be over at the church grounds if it's good, good weather. It may be raining, so it may be on my porch. I'll be interviewing artist um, Ed Nippers. He'll be talking about his new work. And I've he does large biblical narrative paintings, especially crucifixion. There was one enormous uh, painting of the, of the resurrection that I placed at uh, uh, several churches in the, in D.C., in the city, um, Anglican churches, and uh, it was unveiled after the the great shout. And I'll go through all of that. Maybe we can go through that a little bit tomorrow. Anyway, I will start now and um, continue. And then tomorrow for tea time, uh, while interviewing Ed Nippers, I'm going to show you how to make a. Um, Easter nest for the rabbit to land in on, on Easter morning. And then uh, later, I'm going to show you, um, hopefully on, um, I think on, um, yeah, Wednesday, sorry. Wednesday, I will be, um, <laughs> this being at home all the time is confusing me anyway. <laughs> Wednesday, uh, we will be making a garden tomb, and I'll show you how to do that with what just what you have. If you'd like, today at tea time, I showed everybody how to do an Easter egg tree and um, some things like that. So here we go. So I'm going to just go back to just before we ended. Uh, and, and the narrator is saying, you must not imagine that Shasta felt at all as you and I would feel if we had just overheard our parents talking about selling us for slaves. For one thing, his life was already little better than slavery. For all he knew, the lordly stranger on the great horse might be kinder to him than Arshish. Arshish was trying to sell uh, the boy, Shasta. For another, the story about his own discovery. For another, the story about his own discovery in the boat had filled him with excitement, and with a sense of relief. He had often been uneasy because, try as he might, he had never been able to love the fisherman, and he knew that a boy ought to love his father. And now, apparently, he was no relationship to Arshish at all. 
That took a great weight off of his mind. Why, I might be anyone, he thought. I might be the son of a Tarkin myself, or the son of a Tisrock, may he live forever, or of a god. He was standing out in the grassy place before the cottage while he thought these things. Twilight was coming a bit like today. Twilight was coming on a pace, and a star or two was already out, but the remains of the sunset could still be seen in the west. Not far away, the stranger's house, loosely tied to an iron ring in the wall of the donkey's stable, was, was grazing. Shasta strolled over to it, this donkey, and patted its neck. It went on tearing up the grass and took no notice of him. Then another thought came into Shasta's mind. I wonder what sort of man that Tarkin is, he said out loud. It would be splendid if he was kind. Some of the slaves in great lords' houses have next to nothing to do. They wear lovely clothes and eat meat every day. Perhaps he'd take me to the wars, and I'd save his life in a battle, and then he'd set me free and adopt me as his son, and give me a palace and a chariot and a suit of armor. But then he might be a horrid, cruel man. He might send me to work on the fields in chains. I wish I knew. How can I know? I bet this horse knows. If only he could tell me. The horse had lifted its head. Shasta stroked its smooth as satin nose and said, I wish you could talk, old fellow. And then for a second he thought he was dreaming, for quite distinctly, though in a low voice, the horse said, but I can. Hmm. Hello, William. And then for a second he thought he was dreaming. For quite distinctly, low in a low voice, the horse said, But I can. Shasta stared into the horse's great eyes, and his own grew almost as big with astos astonishment. However did you learn to talk? Hush, not so loud, replied the horse. Where I come from, nearly all animals talk. Perhaps you can hear the Canadian geese in the background honking. You can definitely hear the cars, but not many. He says, hush, not so loud, replied the horse. Where I came from, nearly all the animals talk. Wherever is that, asked Shasta. Narnia, answered the horse. The happy land of Narnia. Narnia of the heavenly, heathery mountains and the tiny downs. Narnia of many rivers, the plushing glens, the mossy caverns, and the deep forests ringing with the hammers of the dwarfs. Oh, the sweet air of Narnia. An hour's life there is better than a thousand years in Calamon. It ended with a whinny. <laughs> it sounded very like a sigh. How did you get here, said Shasta. Kidnapped, said the horse, or stolen or captured, whichever you like to call it. I was only a foal at the time. My mother warned me not to range the southern slopes into Ar Arkenland and beyond, but I wouldn't heed her. And by the lion's mane, I have paid for my folly. All these years, I have been a slave to humans, hiding my true nature and pretending to be dumb and witless like their horses. Why didn't you tell them who you were? Not such a fool, that's why. If they'd once found out I could talk, they would have made a show of me at fairs and guarded me more carefully than ever. My last chance of escape would have been gone. And why, began Shasta, but the horse interrupted him. 
Now look, it said, we mustn't waste time on idle questions. You want to know about my master, the Tarkin, Anradin. Well, he's bad. Not too bad for me, but for a war horse costs too much for a war horse costs too much to be treated very badly. But you'd better be lying dead tonight than to go to be a human slave in his house tomorrow. Then I'd better run away, said Shasta, turning very pale. Yes, you had, said the horse. But why not run away with me? Are you going to run away too, said Shasta? Yes, if you'll come with me, answered the horse. This is a chance for both of us. You see, if I run away without a rider, everyone who sees me will say, Stray horse! and be after me as quick as he can. With a rider, I've got a chance to get through. That's where you can help me. On the other hand, you can't get very far on those two silly legs of yours. What absurd legs humans have without being overtaken. But on me, you can outdistance any other horse in this country. That's where I can help you, by the way. I suppose you know how to ride? Oh, yes, of course, said Shasta. At least I've ridden the, the donkey. Ridden the what? retorted the horse with extreme contempt. At least that is what he meant. Actually, it came out as a sort of neigh. Ridden the what, 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 what? Talking horses always sound more horsey in accent when they are angry. <laughs> I found that to be true, too. In other words, it continued, you can't ride. In other words, it continued, you can't ride. That's the drawback. I'll have to teach you as we go along. If you can't ride, can you fall? I suppose anyone can fall, said Shasta. I mean, can you fall and get up again without crying, and mount again and fall again, and yet not be afraid of falling. Uh, I'll try, said Shasta. Poor little beast, said the horse in a gentler tone. I forget you're only a fowl. Oh, so. We'll make a fine rider of you in time, and now we mustn't start until these two in the hut are asleep. Meantime, we can make our plans. My Tarkin is on his way north to the great city, to Tashban itself and the court of Tizrock. I say, put in Shasta in a rather shocked voice, oughtn't you say, may he live forever? Why, asked the horse, I'm a free Narnian. Why should I talk slaves and fools talk? I don't want him to live forever. Whether I want him or not, I know that he's not going to live forever. And I can see you're from the free north, too. No more of this southern jargon between you and me. And now back to our plans. I said my human was on his way north to Tashban. While they're planning this plot, I'm going to put another log on my fire. Okay, now they're making their plans. Does that mean we better go south? I think not, said the horse. You see, he thinks I'm dumb and witless like the other horses. Now, if I really were, the moment I get loose, I'd go back home to my stable and paddock and back to his palace, which is two days' journey. South, that's where he'll look for me. He'd never dream of my going on north on my own. And anyway, he will probably think that someone in the last village who saw him ride through has followed us here and stolen me. Oh, hurrah, said Shasta, then we'll go north. I've been longing to go north all my life. Of course you have, said the horse. That's because of the blood that's in you. I'm sure you're true northern stock. 
not too loud. I should think they'd be asleep by now. I'd better creep back and see, suggested Shasta. That's a good idea, said the horse, but take care you're not caught. It was a good deal darker now and very silent, except the sounds of the waves on the beach, which Shasta, hard, Shasta hardly noticed because he had been hearing it day and night as long as he could remember. The cottage as he approached it showed no light. When he listened at the front, there was no noise. When he went round to the only window, he could hear, after a second or two, the familiar noise of the old fisherman's squeaky snore. It was funny to think it all. Sorry, it was funny to think that if all went well, we would never hear it again. Holding his breath and feeling a little bit sorry, but much less sorry than he was glad, Shasta glided away over the grass and went to the donkey stable, groped along to a place. He knew where the key was hidden. Mm. Opened the door and found the horse's saddle and bridle, which had been locked up there for night. He bent forward and kissed the donkey's nose. And I'm sorry we can't take you, he said. There you are at last, said the horse when he got back to it. I was beginning to wonder what had become of you. I was getting your things out of the stable, replied Shasta. And now can you tell me how to put them on? For the next minutes, Shasta was at work, very cautiously to avoid jingling, while the horse said things like, get that berth, girth a bit tighter, or you'll find a buckle lower down, or you'll need to shorten those stirrups a good bit. When all was finished, it said, now we got to have reins for the look of the thing, but you won't be using them. Tie them to the saddle bow very slack so that I can do what I like with my head. And remember, you are not to touch them. What are they for then? asked Shasta. Ordinarily, they're for directing me, replied the horse. But as I intend to do all the directing on this journey, you'll please keep your hands to yourself. Hey, Matt and Jack. And there's another thing. I'm not going to have you grabbing my mane. Mm. But I say, pleaded Shasta, if I'm not to hold on by the reins or by your mane, what am I to hold on by? You hold on with your knees, said the horse. That's the secret of good riding. Grip my body between your knees as hard as you like. Sit straight up, straight as a poker. Keep your elbows in. And by the, di by the way, what did you do with the spurs? I put them on my heels, of course, said Shasta. I do know that much. Well, then you can take them off and put them in the saddlebag. We may be able to sell them when we get to Tashban. Ready? And now I think you can get up. Oh, you're a dreadful height, gasped Shasta after his first and unsuccessful attempt. I'm a horse, that's all, was the reply. Anyone who think I ha I was a haystack from the way you were trying to climb up, eh, sorry, guys. Anyone would think I was a haystack by the way you were trying to climb up me. There, that's better, now sit up and remember what I told you about your knees. Funny to think of me, who led cavalry charges and won races, having a potato sack like you in the saddle. However, off we go. It chuckled, not unkindly. And it certainly began their night journey with great caution. First of all, they went just south of the fisherman's cottage to the little river where they ran, which ran into the sea and took care to leave in the mud some very plain hoof marks pointing south. That's very clever. But as soon as they were in the middle of the ford, it turned upstream and waited till they were about a hundred yards further inland than the cottage. Then it selected a nice gravelly pit of bank, which would take no footprints and came out on the northern side. 
Then still at a walking pace, it went northward to, till the cottage, the one tree, the donkey stable, and the creek. Everything, in fact, that Shasta had ever known had sunk out of sight in the gray summer night darkness. A little bit like tonight. Um, the sense of the reflection of the sunset behind me is really beautiful. Uh, <coughs> I'm almost, I'm almost facing um, west, kind of northwest. Uh, west, west is straight, kind of off to the left of the stream. He could not see, after leaving his known world, he could not see what was ahead except that it was all open and grassy. It looked endless, wild, lonely, and free. And free. I say, observed the horse, what a place for a gallop. Oh, don't let, said Shasta, not yet. I don't know, I just don't know how to, please, horse. I don't know your name. Bree, any, Brittany, oh, hey, ah, said the horse. I'll never be able to say that, said Shasta. Can I call you Bree? Well, if it's the best you can do, I suppose you must, said the horse. And what shall I call you? I'm called Shasta. Hmm, said Bree. Well, now that's a name that's really hard to pronounce. But now about this gallop, it's a good deal easier than trotting if you only knew because you don't have to rise and fall. Grip with your knees and keep your eyes straight ahead between my ears. Don't look at the ground. If you think you're going to fall, just grip harder and sit up straighter. Ready? Now for Narnia and the North. This endeth this lesson. <laughs> Hi, Robert, Jim. Uh, I have a story to tell. I, um, a few years ago, injured my vertebrae, and I went to the physical therapist, and I live out here in horse country. There are horses just behind us here and over across the street. And uh, Trinity Episcopal Church is just across the street. Anyway, I <laughs> have tell you, so I went to the uh, physical therapist and we were doing really, really great. And I said, you know, I'd like to revive horseback riding. When I was in junior high, I loved horseback riding. My, my folks had horses when I was first uh, taken by them. And then when we moved, they got rid of them because my mom got thrown off a horse and it injured her back. It turned out the horse was blind and they didn't know it. Somebody sold them a, a bad horse. I know another time uh, they were thrown because of a rattlesnake. We lived up in the hills in Southern California. Anyway, so I've lived out here in the hunt country and decided maybe it would be fun to uh, <laughs> ride horses again. And so what, what he just described about the gallop and the trotting, I said, uh, the physical therapist, I said, I just, I think I'd like to ride again. He said, but I, I have a concern the rocking back and forth when the horse is going and um, trotting and so forth, walking, uh, would that injure my lower back? Would that be hard for my lower back? And he smiled and said, well, some people say yes and some people say no. However, I would be more concerned about the distance between the saddle and the ground. So there you have it, <laughs> my Scots. Anyway. This end of this story, and love having you with, with me today. Uh, I'm next going to read some excerpts from Beyond the Wardrobe, the official guide to Narnia. So that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll read this until we're done, and then uh, I'm going to be uh, doing different things this Easter, as I said at the beginning. All of the programs, the tea time at 3, except for Mondays at 4, but every other day 3, and fireside readings at 7 will be the same this week, three and seven, and all of them are eventually posted on YouTube. And my YouTube uh, channel is Glimfeather, G-L-Y-M-F-E-A-T-H-E-R, 
Hall, H-A-L-L, -L, the name of my house. And it's just Limfeather Hall, YouTube.com. I would love any suggestions of anything you'd like to have read of Lewis's. I have something in mind and I'll be announcing it later. Uh, Thursday evening I will be saying a prayer. It's our Monday Thursday service at our church and since no one's there, I'm going to have both the tea time and the um, evening, I hope, there, at least the evening and maybe the tea time. If not, it'll be outside because I'm going to start giving you a tour of the, the beautiful grounds. There's an outdoor chapel. There's, um, it's just beautiful. There are 40 acres set aside for ecclesiastical purposes. And I'll tell you some stories about why I named it um, the Bridge at Glenfeather Hallows. So I hope you have a wonderful evening this evening. And it's also, uh, sorry, it's also posted on my uh, Facebook page. Hope you have a wonderful evening, and I will see you tomorrow at 3 and at 7. Thanks so much for joining me. God bless.